Hi, welcome to the Democratic Club of Christian County, Missouri meeting. Uh, I'm Bob Rubino and I'm the president of the club. And tonight's speaker is Lucas Kuhn, a uh, candidate for U.S. Senator uh, for the Democratic Party here in Missouri. Uh, Lucas is a graduate of Yale University. He has law degrees from the University of Missouri and Columbia Law School. So at this time, I turn it over to you, Lucas. Take it away. Appreciate it. So yeah, I'm Lucas Kuntz. And um, I don't know if anybody's ever seen that video of Lou Gehrig um, when they do the tribute for him, for him in, uh, in the stadium. Uh, and he gets up and says, uh, you know, today I consider myself the luckiest man in the world. Well, every time I hear that bio, uh, I think the same thing. And uh, I just want to say um, the reason for that is that I grew up in Jeff City. Um, I was born and raised in mid-Missouri and the community there and throughout Missouri has really just like hooked me up through my entire life. Um, I, I can give you guys some examples. Thanks, Bob. Like, um, when I was eight years old, my little sister was born. She had a bunch of open heart surgeries. Um, our family struggled with the medical bills. We eventually went bankrupt from them. And, uh, and when we did, you know, everybody in the community came together. We had more food than we could eat. Um, we, they brought us money. My mom actually had her last couple dollars stolen from her purse at Walmart. And uh, the police officer who responded to that went to his parish and helped raise money uh, so that we could get the, get the things that we needed. Um, you know, everybody in the community took us in when my parents spent the kids in, when my parents spent months at Barnes Hospital up in St. Louis uh, with my little sister. And then uh, when I went, when I did really well in high school, I got into Yale, like Bob said, and uh, I didn't know if I had enough money to go to Yale and people in the community gave me scholarships uh, so that I have enough money to go, um, which is incredible. And it gives me this just real feeling like intense feeling that I want to, I want to pay everybody back for all the, all the good things they did to me. And so uh, after Yale, I came back to Mizzou for law school and I actually ran for state rep as a Democrat in Jeff City which is a very intensely red district. Um, I thought that'd be a way to try to make a difference. Uh, I got 43%, which is way better than 30%. Um, and then in 2007, George Bush said we were gonna surge in Iraq and um, I wasn't into that war. I wasn't into that president, uh, but my friend Al Miller who'd helped me out with the campaign uh, had been in Vietnam and he joined the Marine Corps uh, under the same circumstances. And so I talked to him for a little bit and, uh, you know, we talked about all the people in my high school class who'd already been to Iraq um, and just around town. And so I decided that I'd take my law degree and join the Marine Corps. So I did that. Uh, I spent 13 years in the Marine Corps. I deployed to Iraq once, Afghanistan twice. I saw it all. Uh, and then I actually, I spent my last tour, which actually just wrapped up uh, this fall uh, at the end of September at the Pentagon. And... Uh, you know, through all this time, uh, like my goal was to, to fight for Missourians, fight for my country and pay everybody back. And I keep coming home to visit and it just kind of got sadder and sadder. Like the first house I ever lived in is now bulldozed down. It's an empty lot. The second one that I grew up in is vacated um, and it's falling down. The corner store in my old neighborhood's boarded up. And um you know, my dad, when everybody, including Roy Blunt, was saying the economy's booming, the economy's booming, we've recovered from the recession. It took him two years to sell the house I grew up in, and he got almost what he got, what he paid for it in 1987. So this was 30 years later. And, um, and I think the, the thing that I, might, that I find most intense about this is that, you know, Roy Blunt and the Republican legislature have been pretty much burning down Missouri's economy for the last 20 years. And and out of those ashes, I'm seeing the phoenix that's rising as Josh Hawley and Eric Greitens. And I just think that that cannot be the case. There has to be a better way. There has to be a better example. There has to be someone who is truly dedicated to the community, not to you know, become a president or whatever else their goals are. Um, and so, I don't know, I just, you know, I see Josh Hawley telling everybody here, I'm gonna give you $2,000, but he has no goal or agenda or plan to fix the economy that has everyone coming to him begging for $2,000 or $2,000 to begin with. And, uh, and I do, um, I got out of the Marine Corps to fight corporate monopoly power. And so I joined this think tank, the American economic liberties think tank. 
Um, because when I was at the Pentagon, I was seeing just how much damage corporate monopolies were causing to our national security. They shipped all our national security jobs overseas. We can't build any of our military equipment without getting items from China, who was you know, not a very good actor. Um, and we pay a whole lot of money for things that, for end items that aren't even that good these days. Um, and then while I'm working there and starting to see, see like I'm, I'm trying to figure out what's going on in Missouri and what's going on with corporate monopolies. And what I'm seeing is that corporate monopolies are probably the biggest problem with the Missouri's economy. So you see like, you see over and over again, um, businesses being shipped out of Missouri. You can see, you know, like Anheuser-Busch, Ralston Purina, uh, Hardee's, Scott Trade, like the list of businesses is very long. All of our jobs are being outsourced. Um, Roy Blunt's been behind that. You saw the Missouri State Legislature uh, let Smithfields, owned by China, control 25% of our pork production, which means 25% of all the profits from Missouri pork is going to China uh, because of these guys. And so... For me, that's just, that was just more than I could take. I have, you know, the Marine Corps taught me to, to organize, to lead and to fight. And I think that, that right here in Missouri is where, the, where that's needed. I think we need to take it to Roy Blunt. Roy Blunt is behind a lot of this. I mean, it doesn't get more corporate than that guy, right? His wife's a corporate lobbyist. His kids are all lobbyists. And, uh, and I just, I don't know, I'm inspired by, by Missourians in some ways because like, Democrats behind the background have passed ballot initiative after ballot initiative over the Republican legislature. You know, we got workers, we got wages, we got wellness, even medical marijuana. And, uh, and I think it's time we, we figured out how to take those, those issues, tie them to candidates and really make the next step. Um, so that's what I want to do. And that's kind of my really quick pitch. I could ramble on probably forever, but I'd really like to hear and answer any questions you guys have or any thoughts you have um, on the Missouri situation, on a candidacy like mine or anything else. Uh, does anybody have any uh, member to send them in to me in chat, send it to Bob Rubino and I'll be certain to ask him. Lucas, while I have you on, what is your opinion of uh, the national government finally doing something about minimum wage? I think it's great. It's not gonna happen on its own. And here's the thing, like, Businesses, large businesses push down wages. It's what they do. They come in, they become employers of where there's no one else uh, who can hire. And so, um, and so they're able to push down wages. And the only way for us to fight back against that is to have a federal minimum wage. And I think it should be $15. Okay. I have another one here for you. How will you, how will you improve the economies of rural Missouri? And that's a very important thing because a lot of us down here are in rural, rural part of the state. So uh, here's one thing that I really wanna do. We got all these businesses, um, big corporations, taking billions and billions of dollars in federal subsidies every year. You have companies like General Electric, Electric uh, Boeing, Raytheon, and other ones, and they're shipping all the jobs overseas. So what I want to do is say, if you ship jobs overseas, you lose all your federal subsidies. And then what we're gonna, what I'd like to do is take all that money, and I would like to invest it into the local communities. And it's not just going to be rural, but this is going to improve rural America because what I want to try to do is um, is bring in the renewable energy uh, revolution in rural America and in Missouri. And so what I want to do is propose a Marshall Plan for the Midwest, where we take all this money and we pour it into the Midwest. We start, you know, we've been building things in Missouri for generations. And so what I want to do is start building, uh, you know, solar panels, wind turbines, all these things that General Electric has shipped overseas back here in Missouri. And then for local uh, small towns, you know, every house could use energy improvements. Every school building could use energy improvements to save electricity and to save heat. Uh, every municipal building could do that. And there are a lot of great, strong employees and workers in all these small towns and rural areas who are able to do that work. So what I want to do is fund that work so we get the money into the economy at that level. And then we also, at the same time, lower people's bills. I think it's a win-win. Uh, next question. Do you know if Blunt plans to run again? You know, he says he's going to run again. I don't know if, you know, I don't know how happy he's going to be about running again after the last month or so. I think every, every statement I got from him on that was about a month ago. Uh, and I don't know if he's going to run after that. Okay. But I think if Blunt doesn't run, we're going to get uh, 
you know, equally bad opportunity from the other side. It's going to, you know, I don't know, Eric Greitens, um, maybe Jay Ashcroft, somebody like that. So I have a question I want to ask you real quick. Um, mm -hmm. One of the most uh, dynamic senators I've ever met was Claire. And one of the yep. things she used to do was amazing. And she'd have a town hall meeting. She invited everybody. She didn't, she didn't check what your political uh, uh, standing was when you walked in the door and she answered all the questions. Now we have our congressman down here, Billy Long, who was made fun of in the uh, local newspaper because he never talks to anybody and doesn't have any meeting. Roy Blunt is of the same nature. So is Holly. All the Republicans, none of them want to talk to the public. How do you see yourself working to keep yourself in contact with the public? Well, I mean, you know, you don't go to Iraq and Afghanistan three times and then and then come away scared. I'm not scared of talking to anybody. I think that if we present our message and we're honest about it and we say what we want to do, I think voters, um, especially independents, are going to come around to our side and they're going to listen to that and they're going to understand the benefits. So I think that having things like town halls is one of the most important things we can do. I'm going to start having them as soon as I can, even though I'm not elected. I think it's great. Okay, next, next question I have is the business law, such as Anheuser-Busch and the Smithfield invasion, doesn't that depend more on state government versus Washington? What impact could you as a senator have? So some of that is state level, like the state legislator letting legislature undoing their own law that kept uh, Smithfield from owning as much land as it does. But at the federal level, um, we have a lot of strong antitrust laws that we use that aren't enforced right now. So the first thing that I would do is, well, it's not the first thing I do as a senator, but if I can get on like the Judiciary Committee, what I would do is I'd start holding hearings on this. Or if I'm on the Senate Armed Services Committee, I'm going to do it for national security side. And I'm going to hold hearings on what our supply chain looks like, where everything we get is coming from, and really expose the nature of the problem. And, uh, and then what we can do is encourage the Federal Trade Commission to take antitrust lawsuits against these companies uh, for being too big and for suppressing everybody else. Um, because right now, like when you when you got the Smithfields of the world, um, it's very hard for a small business, a smaller business or a small farm to compete with those numbers, right? They, they own the supply chain uh, from the beginning all the way to the end. And I think that once we break them up, uh, well, actually studies have shown that when you break up uh, larger companies, small businesses and families are then able to compete in the marketplace. So what I wanna do is give everyone the ability to compete in the marketplace and the federal government has a lot of tools in order to do that. So I'm gonna bring those tools to bear. Okay. Uh, as a lifetime supporter of Planned Parenthood and a mother of two daughters, will you prioritize defending us against the religious extremists who would end a woman's right to her own body? Yes, I support Roe versus Wade. Okay. Uh, do you think there is a place for small farmers instead of industrial agriculture? What, what should be done to secure our food supply chain? Yes, I think so. And I think, I think the first thing that we do is we take antitrust action against the big farmers. I, what, right now they have too much market power and it squeezes everybody out. And so what I wanna do is break that up so their market power is not as strong. And this goes all the way from the beginning. When they purchase their hogs or they purchase their cattle, they get a better price. When they sell, they get a better price. Um, because they're able to, to maximize with their market power and force buyers and suppliers uh, to do what they want. So yes, I think, I think there's, a, there's a very strong place for smaller and family farms, but I think the only way we're gonna get there is if we start breaking them up, breaking up the big ones. And for a bit of a point of information there, uh, a Congresswoman in this state, Vicki Hartzler, and I think Mr. Shaughnessy could back this up. Uh, she is the largest uh, receiver of uh, her family owns farmland. She receives the large one of the largest amounts of uh, whatever the funds are called that uh, put land bank land. Mm -hmm. She gets uh, extreme. John, you want to turn yourself on? You want to, Mr. Shaughnessy? Got there it. you go. Got it. Okay. Well, would you? I can't really add a whole lot more than she she breaks it in every time. And, um, you know, she, she's, um, she's on my bad list right now. I'll just say that. <laughs> so, but yeah, she does that. You know, I'm more concerned about her having blood on her hands okay. after the last week, but that's, well, I'm going to let, 
I'm going to let Lucas answer, you know, kind of go back to that, you know, speak about that issue. If you mind, Lucas. Uh, which issue, sorry? I'm sorry? Uh, I'm sorry, which issue? That she's getting a lot of money off of that? Yeah, she's getting a lot of money. I mean, is that appropriate that these large farming operations, you have to shut down, the, the, the Congress gives them all this money not to utilize land, and yet they get rich off of it, and then they complain about every, about all the other social programs. Yeah, I mean, I do think that's a problem. I, I think, and I think the worst part about that problem is that Vicki Hartzler is probably supporting that, and so what you have is the same sort of corruption that, that you got when Roy Blunt wants to do the USMCA and expand NAFTA because um, it's not helping, nor, you know, he says it's going to bring $2 billion uh, to the economy, but it's not bringing $2 billion to the, or $200 billion to the Missouri economy. It's, uh, it's all dairy products and uh, his wife is the lobbyist for Kraft Foods. So it's just the same sort of thing uh, where you got people serving themselves. Uh, how will you combat the attack that will come from uh, gun supporters against your candidacy? Well, I mean, on the bright front, the NRA is now bankrupt. So uh, that should provide a little less fodder <laughs> for the, uh, the commercials that they usually are pumping out. But uh, no, I mean, I think it's reasonable to have uh, some, you know, I don't think, for example, that domestic violent offenders should be able to have a weapon. And when, when you poll Missourians and Americans on that question, uh, they come out very, very strongly in, in support of that, that there should be a background check so that people like that don't get it. So, I mean, I'm just going to try to talk sense to reason, um, although that does seem to be hard on guns in Missouri. I think that's the approach I'm going to take. Our, our local state representative here in our area is the one that pushes guns for everybody. He actually wants to overrule federal law that prevents him from being carrying guns into uh, federal uh, reservations or federal buildings. Yeah, here's the thing. If you support the police, then why would you want a violent offender to have a weapon? It makes no sense. So I'm just going to keep talking on issues like that. And people either agree with it or they don't. But I don't think it's something to really compromise on. Uh, would you care to talk about the CARES Act funding? Yeah, so um, as far as the CARES Act goes, I think that I think that the the funding to people was appropriate, but but what was hidden in the CARES Act was that the Federal Reserve is printing $120 billion to give it to corporations and the stock market and Wall Street right now to keep stocks up. And so so my real beef with this is why do we have $120 billion a month, which is more than a trillion dollars a year to do that, but we don't have enough money to do renewable energy. We don't have enough money to pay for our kids' schools. We don't have enough money for any of the things that actually invest in our economy. So, so what I see in the background of the CARES Act is the same thing that we've seen over and over again. And that's that our legislature um, is, or our Congress is captured uh, by special interests. And the only thing that we know how to create anymore is asset bubbles. We pump a lot of money into the stock market or into real estate bubbles, and we don't put anything into actual production. And that's why we're falling behind China. It's why, we're, why we don't have as many jobs as we used to have. And it's why wages are suppressed because everybody is focusing on Wall Street instead of actually creating things. And so we don't create anything. We're in an asset bubble right now. I wouldn't be surprised if we crashed at some point um, once, we, once we turn off that faucet. But I mean, the main point is if we got trillions of dollars for Wall Street, then we should have billions of dollars for everybody else, right? So that's that was the big that. that was the big argument after the 2008 uh, economy crash, in which all the banks were uh, uh, bailed out. Nobody was held accountable for all the losses that they incurred, and everybody else out here in the uh, working world ended up paying the the bigger cost. Not that's right. And I worked foreclosures during that time for Marines who were getting foreclosed upon. They were getting foreclosed left and right. And the banks were taking advantage of them. It was terrible. And we did not have uh, the legal recourse to do anything about it. And it's, it's, you know, it's really disappointing. That's what we're going to get when we got the Roy Blunts of the world in there, right? Like, Your point being, the law was it, the law was against the working man. But it, yeah, it's frequently against the working man and woman. How do you plan to beat Blunt when Jason Kander, who had similar background as yours, did not succeed? Sure. So um, 
Jason Kander was within three points, which is very close. And uh, I have the backing from some organizations. Uh, they're national, uh, like Way to Win, which um, put $100 million into Arizona, Georgia, Texas, and North Carolina this last go around. And you saw that that helped flip Ar Arizona and Georgia, at least. And so um, what we're planning on doing is trying to do a very grassroots-based organizing campaign like, uh, like they did in Georgia. And so they had been fun they'd been funding Stacey Abrams for about eight years. And I talked to the leader of it, and they're looking at certain C3 and C4 organizations right now to try to pump money into Missouri. Uh, I have convinced them that Missouri can be a core state in 2022. Um, they think that I would be a good candidate to help deliver that message. And so what we want to do is try to try to start making that difference. And now that difference is not enough uh, to close the gap that say, you know, um, Parson Galloway had, but it's more than enough to close a 3% gap on Roy Blunt. Um, and it's and it's not going to be a Trump year in, in 2022. And Candor was in a Trump year, and last year was in a Trump year. That's a very that's a very different story. And uh, I'm going to make this. And, and we have actually done polling, and our polling shows us uh, like if Candor were to run again, which by the way, if he was running, I wouldn't be running right now. Like um, he's even with Blunt if you pull them right now, like dead even. And Blunt has higher unfavorability ratings. So, you know, the, the opportunity is there. I'm glad to hear that. And let me, let me ask this question, last question. So business, businesses ship production overseas because labor is less expensive. What can a senator do to address labor costs in the U.S. versus like what, what it costs in China? How can we, how can we you know, help businesses look in, looking how we can improve the overall uh, quality of manufacturing and other jobs here in this country instead of shoving them overseas. And so this is, so, so this, this is uh, true in some ways, and it's also true, not true in others. So like when you look at the iPhone, for example, the most expensive iPhone components come from uh, Sweden, Switzerland, and Germany. And so what we haven't done is we haven't, we haven't invested in the type of education and machining uh, that those countries have done and, and places like Apple. I mean, I'm telling you, these are unionized countries where wages are higher than they are here, right? And, and these components are made overseas, uh, but, but they're not made in China. And so what you see is a lot of the assembling is in China, but some of the higher tech components are made overseas. Uh, you, you see the same thing in like semiconductors, which are made a lot of the times in South Korea, which has a rise and uh, Taiwan, which have rising um, wages as well. And so, what, what, we, what we need to do is, and I'm actually not against uh, the tariffs, like Trump put in tariffs. Um, if someone's going to cheat on labor costs, then we need to even the playing field for that. Uh, you know, you, you've, I don't know how many people watched that. I can't remember the name of it. It was like our factory or factory town or something like that, where, where, um, where Chinese workers came to the United States to like work on a glass factory and try to get the, uh, the Americans to set up a glass factory here for the Chinese company. But yeah, those guys were working 30 days and they were working like 12 hour days. If people aren't going to respect the same level of um, employee rights that we do, then we need to build that cost into the product uh, so that we can compete on an even playing field. Like I'm in essentially what I'm saying is we shouldn't just be competing on overall cost. We need to make sure that our labor is competitive as well. And if this is, and, you know, tariffs are one of the ways to do it. Also, some of these trade agreements we have are quite poor. We should, if we're going to do another trade agreement, we need to include labor side in the trade agreement so that it looks at the cost of labor, it looks at the cost of health care, it looks at the cost of all these other things, and it, and it equalizes the price of labor. Very good. Does anybody else have another question? Any comment? Um, uh, one, one thing I, I would like to ask, Lucas, and sorry I didn't do it through chat. No through chat, But um, what about the... Um, the environment what what about yeah so he, here's here's when i was in iraq like and we were having a bad day right um or someone was missing a birthday or something like that you know one of the running jokes we had was why are we here again why are we here and the answer was always oil everybody knew that the reason we were there was oil right and the thing about oil is as you know, that it's carbon and it's bad for the environment. And so 
We spent $14 trillion in Iraq and Afghanistan and Syria and everywhere else over there fighting these, these essentially endless wars. And the cost to, with no return on investment, just a bunch of people dead and still a mess over there, right? And, and the estimate for, for fully, fully making our electric grid renewable, including automobiles, is $4 trillion. So we spent $14 trillion for nothing, or we can spend $4 trillion to get completely off the oil, improve the climate, and bring all these jobs to America. Like we can't, we can't create oil out of thin air, right? You can't come to Missouri, dig in the ground and get oil, but you can come to Missouri and build solar panels or wind turbines. You can come here and you can do energy efficient improvements on every single building. You can improve the infrastructure here. You can improve the electric grid. So we can create that. We can actually make our own oil here like that. And I think it's one of the top things that we need to invest in both for jobs and for national security. I tell you what, I don't want to go to Afghanistan again, right? I don't want to go to Iraq again. So it's, uh, it's, I don't think any kid should have to do that. It wasn't, it wasn't a good deal. You know, we did it for our country uh, and it turned out that our country was doing it for corporations and it's very disappointing. One quick question just came to mind. I need to mm -hmm. ask you do, you, do you think that we should uh, go back to Iran, Iran and try to restart that uh, uh, agreement we had with them? Yes, I think you should, I, th I think we should have an agreement with Iran uh, if we can if we can get one. I don't know that they're gonna I don't know that they're gonna come around to that same agreement again. So we're gonna need to really work with allies to make that happen. Um, but again, this is another weird thing where it's like we're allies with Saudi Arabia because they have oil. But like the Saudis, I mean, it was like fifteen out of the nineteen hijackers from were from Saudi Arabia. Like they've been spreading terrorism around the around the world for forever. It's 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 extremely disappointing that we're messing around in the Middle East at all. And if we can get off oil, we solve that problem. So I just want us off of it. And, uh, and now you kind of got me on a roll, Bob, but like this really irritates me. And that's that, you know, we protect the Straits of Hormuz, which is a, a passageway that all the oil goes through that Iran looks at. And 80% of that oil goes to China. We're protecting China's supply chain with the, the U.S. Navy's fifth fleet. It makes absolutely no sense. And I just, just we just need to be done with that area. It's a quagmire. Well, Thank you, Lucas. Good job. Thank you, Lucas. Semper Fi. Semper Fi, Dave. See you guys. See ya.